So we've talked about thermodynamics and chemical equations, and most of the balancing of chemical equations that we've done um, have been just uh, sort of unknown ways of reacting. Then we got into acid bases, where we realized that these particular reactions were just a transfer of, a, of an H, right? A proton transfer. And so today, on, uh, on today's balancing of equations, it's going to be redox reactions, which is sort of a com combined word. It's reduction oxidation. So this always happens in pairs, just like acid base always happens in pairs. So there's a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent, and they are exchanging electrons. It's a little bit more difficult to balance because the electrons are really not tracked in the elemental symbols. Right? So the elemental symbols we have on the periodic table, and you may or may not know when a redox reaction happens. You have to kind of study to see if the oxidation numbers have changed. So these are some concepts that we're going to be studying today. That's why we kind of hold these off a little bit, because they're a little more advanced than the acid-base reactions or just other kinds of reactions. So there's a definite procedure for, for balancing redox reactions. I can remember doing this as a freshman and not following the procedure and like filling up a whole piece of paper where I, you know, double this thing to make the elements work out and then that screws something up on this side and then I fix that problem and it creates another problem and then I fix that problem and it's like a cookies and milk problem where you run out of cookies, you add, you know, you still got milk, you add more cookies and then you run out of milk and then you add more milk. So you can get really wrapped around the axle if you don't follow the procedure on balancing redox reactions. And so I can remember doing that as a freshman. Then I went back and looked at my notes and said, oh, if I follow these steps, then it works out. So in acid-base reactions, we had acids donating protons and bases accepting protons. But in electrochemical reactions, electrons are transferred from one species to another. <clears throat> and in order to keep track of what loses electrons and what gains electrons, we can assign oxidation numbers. You don't have to use oxidation numbers. You can balance these equations without them but it really is helpful if you understand how to compute oxidation numbers. So we'll start with that. So in this reaction, we have a uh, zinc metal up here in the spatula being dumped into an acid solution, HCl. And uh, the zinc metal is a zinc solid and its oxidation number is zero. So you can put that up here like a zero charge on the individual zinc atoms. And it's in contact with uh, acid protons in solution, really hydronium ion, but we typically write it H plus when we're dealing with these kinds of uh, uh, electrochemical reactions. And then what happens here? The electrons leave the zinc and it goes into solution. So it was a solid and now it's aqueous. It's a cation. It's coupled with two anions, the two chlorides. And the two cations, the hydrogens have gotten together and formed hydrogen gas, H2. That seems weird because these are two positive charges, H pluses, they're not gonna wanna be near each other. But if you give them a couple of electrons, then they can make H2 gas. And so they steal the electrons from the zinc and make H2 gas. And so here we have hydrogen with a zero oxidation number. We have zinc with two plus. Here we have two hydrogen or protons, two hydrogen ions. And so the balances all work out and the oxidation numbers all work out and you can see what happened. So electrons went from the zinc to the hydrogens. So even though there's two hydrogens and it says plus one, it's so like that's it's not plus two. <laughs> Where? Over on the right? So the blue? Yeah. Yeah, so here. Not there, the other one. On the other side. Oh, over here, this plus one right here? Yeah, because yeah. there's two hydrogens. Right, so it's talking about, that's good, it's on the individual atoms. Okay. Yeah, so like when I put a zero here, or put a zero here, that means each hydrogen has a zero okay. charge. Yeah. Um, that's great. Like if we were to think about, let me try to think of... Like, uh, we've done this with the binary naming, like calcium chloride. How many chlorides do I need? We know the calcium is two plus. We know the chloride is a minus, so we need two of them. And so that little minus goes with each each atom or each ion. So that would be a plus one then, or minus one, sorry. No, no, so this, this right here goes with each chloride, okay? And there's two of those. 
So the two times that negative equals the two positive. Okay. So if we're making our binary, this we did this with the naming. So in the first semester, so if we were gonna do aluminum chloride, how do I know how many chlorides? Well, I've got to look at the oxidation number of the aluminum. It's a three plus ion. The chloride is typically a one minus. And so if I want, if I want to balance the charges, I need three of those negatives. Okay. Yeah. And we're kind of doing the same thing, only it gets a little more complicated when we have something like SO4. And we'll do that as an example. Oh, two minus, goodness gracious. Why did I put a plus? Um, two minus. So we can have the oxidation uh, number for each of the oxygens and the sulfur. So we can break down the polyatomic anions and, and molecules to look at the oxidation numbers of each of the atoms. <clears throat> so this process, this kind of reaction is, we call it a redox reaction, but it's, it's oxidation and reduction. Um, so a species is oxidized when it loses electrons. Okay. And so oxidation is this loss of electrons. And then a species is reduced when it gains electrons. And so reduction is gain of electrons. So what are we talking about? We're talking about reactants. So you could maybe even mark through species and say a reactant. So that, that narrows our choices. Like if I were to give a multiple choice test to say which one of these was oxidized, I'm gonna list all four things you see in the problem, but you know that half of those are bogus because these are products, okay? And so it's down to 50-50. And it's one of those reactants was oxidized, the other was reduced. And so which one of these lost electrons when it went past the arrow? Here's a zinc it has a zero charge. Here's a zinc, it has a two plus. It had to have lost electrons. So the zinc was oxidized. So we say zinc was oxidized. And which one gained electrons? So this H plus, now over here it's H zero. And so it gained an electron to get rid of that plus charge. And so H plus gained or, or was, was reduced, I'll say. And so the way you can remember this, the way we remember this in Texas is oil rig. <laughs> Oxidation is loss of electrons and, and uh, reduction is gain of electrons. And so that's something you can remember. Uh, even if you don't like fossil fuels, you can still remember oil rig. <laughs> okay. But it's, again, it's a past tense thing. So I think of this reaction happened. Now let's think about what happened. In the reactants, something happened. One of those reactants gained electrons and was reduced. The other uh, reactant lost electrons and was oxidized. Okay. So <clears throat> if, if zinc was oxidized, then the H plus was the oxidizing agent. So it's the thing that stole the electron. So think about this word agent, okay? And so this is always, you know how in acids and bases, we have acids and their conjugate bases, they form those pairs. These are some pairs too. If zinc is oxidized, then the other thing has to be the agent that did the action, that oxidized it, okay? And so then uh, if, if uh, what was oxidized was the reducing agent. So if, um, if hydrogen was reduced, then zinc was the reducing agent. So you gotta really pay attention to the grammar here and the endings of the words, okay? And so you can think if zinc was oxidized, who did that, right? You look at the reactants, it's the other guy that did that. And if, if hydrogen was reduced, then who did that? Well, it was the zinc. So that's just, people make that much harder than it needs to be. So I'm just telling you, these two slides are, are places where people make common mistakes. And they're very easy to ask, you know, because it's just uh, being able to categorize your reactants correctly. Okay, let's assign oxidation numbers. 
So here's a little, um, some guidelines for assigning those numbers. So elements in their elemental form have an oxidation number of zero. So things like zinc solid, so you've got solid zinc, but even things that have um, allotropes where there's multiple atoms like S8. So the natural form of sulfur is a ring structure with eight sulfur atoms. And so you're looking at this S8 solid, what's the oxidation number for sulfur in that situation? Well, it's sulfur bonded to sulfur. So why would it lose electrons to something that has just exactly the same pull for those electrons? So there's a perfect sharing of those electrons if it's the same kind of atom. Remember the reason the electrons are stuck to these atoms in the first place is because of the protons. And so sulfur atoms have the same number of protons as other sulfur atoms. And so they're not gonna pull the electrons from each other. So we would assign zero oxidation numbers for any of these pure elements. Nitrogen, N2, or even C60. So a carbon soccer ball with 60 carbon atoms. Again, those carbon atoms, each one of those has a zero charge on it in terms of oxidation number. Um, the sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound is zero. So if you have something like water, it's neutral. The, Oxidation numbers on hydrogen and on oxygen will sum to zero. And we were just doing that with the calcium chloride. We were saying calcium chloride overall is zero. So the chloride oxidation numbers have to add up to the calcium. Okay. And then the sum of the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion is the charge on the ion. So like SO4, two minus then the sulfur and the oxygens would all balance out to where the sum of all of those would equal two minus. HPO4, two minus, and NH4 plus, et cetera. So we'll do some of these examples. So we use the Lewis Dodd formula and the formal charge technique to determine the oxidation number of a particular atom. So let's practice on these. And so here's how we calculate the formal charge. It's the valence electrons, minus the claimed electrons. So let's practice that. Let's do, um, let's do something interesting first. Let's do CO2. So if you go through CO2 and you make the Lewis Dodd structure for CO2, this is what you end up with. It had to share the double bonds because of the octet rule. So we had a eight electrons for oxygen, eight electrons for carbon, and eight electrons for oxygen. So let's calculate the formal charge on all of these. <clears throat> so for this oxygen, we come in with six valence electrons. Okay, so how do we know that? Well, it's way over there. You see that Roman numeral at the top, six? It's the sixth column, not counting the D-block elements. And so that's the number of valence electrons it has. If we go to fluorine and neon, you see that gets you to eight. And so you know that the noble gases have eight valence electrons. Halogens would then be seven. Oxygen would be six. So if you don't want to count from the left, you can count from the right. Just subtract down. Um, nitrogen would have five, right? So it's three away from eight. Okay. And so that'd be the six valence electrons on oxygen. Now, how many can it contain? How can it claim? We're gonna break these double bonds for the purposes of calculating the formal charge. We're gonna break these in half. Okay, and so we're gonna just count one electron for each of those bonds. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So minus six, and I'm gonna call these CE, claimed electrons, right? Claimed electrons, I'm gonna call it CE. And these are VE. Okay, so that you know my terminology. So we have six minus six, so it has a formal charge of zero. And in fact, any kind of oxygen like that, that has two lone pairs and two bonds, is gonna have a formal charge of zero. Let's look at the carbon. We split these bonds in half. The carbon comes in with four valence electrons. And it can claim four, because each of those bonds gives it one. So. So it has a zero formal charge. <clears throat> so we could put a, a zero by that atom, a zero by the oxygen, a zero by that. Um, let's do, um, before we get into, um, let's do NH4, that'll be a nice, easy introduction. So 
we'll just do the the, the freshman chemistry um, Lewis dot structure without the three-dimensional shape so no Vesper shape here we'll just do NH4 I'm trying to draw a bracket around that and the whole thing is plus one okay so here's here's my molecule the whole thing is plus one let's do hydrogen first this is super easy we have one valence electron for hydrogen and if we split that bond in half it can claim one minus one claimed electron okay so we have a zero formal charge on all the hydrogens so zeros on every little hydrogen now the fun one let's do nitrogen if we look at the periodic table, we count over, it's in the fifth column, so that's five valence electrons. And it can claim four. So if you look at all four of these single bonds, it splits them evenly with the hydrogen. So four claimed electrons. So it has a plus one formal charge. So we would put a plus one on that nitrogen. And if you add up four zeros and add a plus one, we end up with the charge on the ion. So this is kind of telling us that that charge is on the nitrogen. It's one way to interpret it. Okay, let's do uh, let's do sulfate. That'll be a, an exciting one. Okay. So, so we start out with, I guess, the basic Lewis dot structure of sulfur, we draw single bonds to all the oxygens. Here, let me, let me start over on that. Okay, let's do, I'll do this run from, um, like from the very beginning without any, any shortcuts, okay? Okay, so we have SO4, two minus. How many valence electrons does sulfur have? Six, very good. And then we have four oxygens. And how many of each of those oxygens have? Six as well, okay? So this is the total number of, and, and plus we have a two minus. We have two extra ones, plus two more. So this is how you add up all the electrons that you have to deal with. You go from the formula, you add up all of the valence electrons, so what do we end up with? We've got five times six is 30 plus two, so 32 electrons total. Okay, so then we, we start out with making single bonds with everything. And we put the sulfur in the middle and we make single bonds with all of the oxygens. Okay, so how many have we used up? There's two electrons for each bond, so two, four, six, eight, so minus eight electrons, so they would call these bonding electrons. Okay, and so then we have, what, 24 left? And so then we go around and we fill out the octets on all of the oxygens. So this is tedious, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, we got it. Minus 24, so we have zero electrons left. So that's the Lewis dot structure for the sulfate. We can put the bracket on there and do two minus on it. Okay, great, so everybody follow that. That should be a bit of review. Now let's calculate the formal charge on each of these, which would be the oxidation number for each of the atoms. So let's pick this oxygen one. Split that bond, draw a circle around everything. And so this guy has six valence electrons that it brought to the party. And it gets to claim seven. See, if I count up my lone pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one for that bond, I've got seven. So minus seven claimed electrons. I have a, mi I have a minus one formal charge. So I'm going to put a minus one on that oxygen. And look, all these other oxygens look exactly the same. Yes? Where'd you get the seven from again? Um, when I drew the circle around it, notice I split that bond in half. And so it's all the electrons in that circle. 
just like up here on this oxygen, I drew that, it's kind of a, I split those bonds in half and I got one electron for each. So that's the claimed electrons. So in kind of, we're saying in a covalent bond, let's just split the electrons evenly and let, you know, one go with each atom. That's how we're calling it claimed electrons in, in this molecule. So that'd be a minus seven for that one. And you end up with a minus one formal charge on all of those oxygens. So I'm gonna put those on all of the oxygens. Minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Now let's do sulfur. So sulfur has six valence electrons and it can only claim four. I'm gonna split all of those bonds in half. Minus four claimed electrons. And so I have a plus two formal charge. And if you add up all those charges, they add up to minus two. Is that cool? Okay. Um, is there a way to draw this molecule where we don't have so many big formal charges? I wouldn't ask, right, if there wasn't. <laughs> so, so let's think about this. This is another way to sort of finish out the Lewis dot formula. I don't know if they taught it to you in your first course, but I'm teaching it to you now. Um, so if I've got a negative charge right next to a positive charge, I'm going to want to share that negative electron. It's going to pull that electron towards it. So let's make some double bonds. So if I draw this SO4 with some double bonded oxygens. So I got rid of those two positive charges on the sulfur by sharing a couple more bonds. Let's see what that did for us in terms of formal charge. Remember on CO2, when I had this kind of oxygen, what was the formal charge on this kind of oxygen? A double bond and two lone pairs. It was a zero. I brought in six, six valence electrons and I could claim six. And so that had a formal charge of zero. So this one has a formal charge of zero. This one has a formal charge of zero. This one is still a minus one. We don't have to redo it because that's what we have down below, minus one. Let's do sulfur now. So looking at this, if I draw a box around sulfur and I break all the bonds evenly. Okay, sulfur brings in six valence electrons and it gets to claim six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so it has a formal charge of zero. And yet all of them still add up to two minus because I still have two oxygens that are negative two. Okay. Why didn't I make double bonds out of these? Well, the sulfur is already down to zero. It doesn't want any more electrons. Okay, so sharing two double bonds, uh, sharing, you know, making two double bonds was enough to get the formal charges as small as possible across the whole molecule. Um, if you're talking about Lewis dot formulas, um, if, if there's no mention of formal charge, the bottom one, right? You would just do the Lewis dot formula and you could end up with the bottom <laughs> structure. But if I say with the minimal formal charges, notice how the bottom one has five formal charges that are non-zero and the top one only has two formal charges that are non-zero. And so we've minimized the formal charges by making the top structure. Now notice the top structure makes sense of molecules like H2SO4 because I've got a two minus here. I've got a, I could put a hydrogen plus on this one and I could put a hydrogen plus on this one. So that makes sense. Down here, it looks like I'd be tempted to put four hydrogen pluses on there, but not really because the sulfur is holding a positive charge. And so this one does kind of make sense of the, the molecule H2SO4. So that's why we like the formal charge because it makes sense of the chemistry. Um, in organic, if you go on to organic, you're gonna see also that there's a thing called resonance structures. Why did I choose these two oxygens to put the double bonds on? It was just my choice, right? I could have chosen this one for the double bond, 
or I could have chosen this one for the double bond. So there's a lot of ways I could have written it with different double bonds and two molecules that have the same, have everything in common except the locations of the double bonds, that's called a resonance structure. And, and that's a really important thing in organic. So um, just a little foreshadowing there. If you go onto organic, if we put the double bonds in different places, but the rest of the molecule is the same, that's called a resonance structure. It's like the electron cloud has uh, resonance, like it's, ri it's ringing between all the different structures. And so it's, um, yeah. So now let's get into the meat of everything, the balancing of the redox equations. This is, I think this is fun. It's way better than Sudoku and easier in Max's case. You know, it's like a puzzle, right? You got a problem and you're like, how do I balance these things? I've got to split them into two reactions on paper and I can balance the reactions separately and then combine them in the end. So we're going to split this into two reactions and then you follow these steps in order and it's easy. If you don't follow it in order, you can waste a lot of time. Yeah. So here's your half reaction method. I put a big star on this page. You should too. Um, these are the rules or the order, the procedure. So first step, break the reaction into two half reactions. The most of the time this is easy. There's a, there's a few uh, weird examples that, that, that um, make you scratch your head a little bit, but most of these are really easy. Uh, balance each half reaction independently. And how do we do that part? Okay, these are the specific rules. You first balance all the elements other than hydrogen and oxygen. Just save those for the end. Okay, so if you've got zinc or iron or chlorine or whatever, any of those elements, you balance those first and just ignore the hydrogens and the, and the oxygens. Then you do the oxygens next. So if you see two oxygens on the right, then on the left you add two waters. Okay, so if you have a, three oxygens on the left, then you put three waters on the right. So oxygen equals water when you're balancing these half reactions. You're using water to balance the oxygens. Most of these are aqueous solutions, and so water is readily available to participate in the reaction. Then you, you clean up the mess you made by adding all of those H's with the water by adding acid protons. Okay, so that's the handle you have on fixing the H's that you just added. So maybe there's no hydrogen in your problem at all. You've got oxygen, you start adding waters, and now you've got hydrogen in your reaction. What are you going to do with that? Well, you start adding acid protons to balance out the hydrogens. But now you're adding positive charges. So you're going to have to balance those charges by adding electrons. And so in these half reactions, electrons will be one of the reactants and one of the products. Okay. And so then we'll, we'll match them together to get rid of the electrons and cancel the electrons. So that we multiply those half reactions by integers so that the electrons delivered by one reaction will be absorbed by the other reaction. And then we can sum everything together, add them together. We subtract things that appear on both sides. Like if I have three waters on the left and five waters on the right, I subtract three from both sides. So I only have water on one side. So we learn by doing, so let's jump in and do one. We have done acid-base titrations where we had to put an indicator in. We could also do redox reactions by titration. And so if you want to know, like, um, I don't know, if you're trying to titrate, say, uh, uh, some sort of battery reaction or something, and you have the electrolytes and you have the, the active species in there, you could use a redox reaction to titrate those battery components because it's an oxidation reduction reaction, not an acid base reaction. And potassium permanganate is a really good oxidizing agent, and it happens to be dark purple. And so if you put it in there and it oxidizes something in solution, the purple color goes away because the permanganate reacted. But one drop passed when you run out of, say in this case, oxalate, when we run out of oxalate, the very next drop of permanganate turns the whole solution purple. So it is its own indicator. So this is a great way to do titrations. The, the oxidizing agent and the indicator are the same thing. And when you run out of uh, the thing that's being oxidized, then the, the purple color stays. So let's balance this reaction. So we're just given the main parties here uh, and we're going to balance these. So when I say it's kind of easy to break it into half reactions, look what I'm talking about. One half of the reaction 
will be everything that contains manganese. So that will be one re half reaction, and the other half reaction will be everything that contains the carbon for the oxalate. So we, we look at the reaction, we're like, okay, there's something going on between manganese and carbon here. So we'll pull the manganese ions out and the carbon ions out, and we'll balance those as two separate reactions. So let's do the carbon one first. These are the main species that we have here. And so we're looking at this, what was the first step? So if you've got your notes, kind of scroll back. The first step was breaking into half reaction, so we did that. So what's this next step? Elements other than hydrogen and oxygen. So to balance the carbon, we add a coefficient of two. Now I've written this reaction many times. If you have multicolored pencil or something, you can just do it on the top one, <laughs> you know, but anyway, I've just written it, written it down. So we balance by adding a coefficient of two. So now the carbons are balanced <coughs> and it actually balanced the oxygen. So we got lucky. So two times two is four. So we have four oxygens on the left, four oxygens on the right. So carbon's balanced, oxygen's balanced. And so all the elements are balanced. The only thing that's not balanced is the charge. So we have a, a minus two. And so both sides have to equal each other. So we have um, two minus is equal to zero. And how do I get the left side and the right side to equal each other by adding electrons? And when you add electrons, you're adding negative charges. So you can only subtract things. So I can't put electrons on this side because if I put electrons on this side, I'll have a minus whatever. And so it would just get more negative and that's never gonna equal zero. So I can't put electrons on this side. I have to put them on the more positive side. So if I add two electrons over here, then I have zero minus two on the right and a minus two on the left. So they equal each other. So that's that takes some thinking. That's part of the puzzle. It's like, which side do I put the electrons on? And so I have a minus two is equal to zero minus two. And so the charges balance out. Any questions on this one before we get to the more complicated permanganate? Complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so let's do the permanganate. And so there's the, the main players. The MnO4 became Mn2 plus in this reaction. And so we, we balanced the manganese already. So to do the oxygen, we have to add four waters to the right side. And so we have the MnO4 gives Mn2 plus plus four waters. And this is what I was saying. Now we've messed things up. We've had it, and then we've got hydrogens. And so we've got to do something with the hydrogens next. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we have four of those times two, so eight H pluses. And this is also with these reactions, they get kind of big, sometimes 14, 24. You know, you have a, a lot of H pluses. So we can add those on the left side. Okay, so now all the elements are balanced. We have two, a manganese on either side, four oxygens, eight hydrogens, okay? And then we've got to balance the charge. So how do we see that? So we've got a, a plus eight over here. Let's go ahead and write this out. Plus eight minus one is equal to plus two plus zero. So I've got, it, I've got all the charges on there. So on the left side, what have I got? I've got eight minus eight minus one, which on the left side is seven, and on the right, I just have two. So notice I don't have to get seven down to zero, I just have to get seven down to two so that they balance. That's another place people go wrong. They see seven pluses on the left and say, like, put in seven electrons. No, you've gone too far. You just bring it down to two, because that's what's on the right side. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going to add. We need a. We need a minus. Uh, we need a minus five over here to get it to balance. So is your goal to always have the reactant side, like, like prioritize that side over the the product side? No, it's just whichever side is highest. 
So on the left side, we had a plus seven. And on the right side, on the right side, we had a plus two. And so the plus seven is the most positive side. So that's the side we're going to add electrons to. We're going to bring it down to two so that it balances. So we add the five electrons. And so now we have a, yeah, so let's show the balance. Minus five plus eight uh, minus one is equal to plus two. And now all the charges are balanced, all the elements are balanced, and so this is a balanced half reaction. And the nice thing is you can check your work. You can look to see that the charge is balanced, that's what I just wrote above that one, and you can also check that the elements balance. Four oxygens on either side, one manganese, eight hydrogens, and so there's lots of ways to check. This is why I said it's like Sudoku, but even better, right? Because you can check the column, you can check the row, you can check the box, and all of that. There's lots of ways to check your work on these. Yes. You can flip it around. It's just like algebra. You know, you could have two x plus three y or three y plus two x. Yeah, same thing. And it's if you think of it mathematically, it's very similar. Like just how you could subtract something from both sides. Later on, when we have waters on both sides, you could subtract. I have you know five x on one side and three x on the other. I can subtract three x from both sides. And the same with the elements. Yeah. Okay, so now we combine the half reactions. So we got to write them out again. We align the arrows. I think that makes it easy. So align the arrows, and you've got the C2O4, 2 minus, giving two CO2s and two electrons. And then the, the bottom reaction with the five electrons, etc. And now remember, these reactions have to cooperate. So the permanganate cannot get five electrons from an oxalate that only gives two. So we've got to balance them by how many electrons are exchanged. So do you see what I've done here with the five and the two? I've got five electrons here. So I multiply this one because that's the, the, the least common factor or is it multiple? Least common multiple is 10. How are you going to get two and five to equal each other? Well, you can multiply you know, two times five and get to 10 and five times two and get to 10. So these are gonna exchange in units of 10 electrons. You can't do the half of them? You could, but this would be best if you just go to the, use the integers. It's gonna work out the same. And so this is pretty easy. Um, so it's kind of like that cross multiplication. You know, I've got two here. I've even color coded it for you and five there. Yeah, so that will always work. It, it might even be bigger than you need, but it will always work. Um, so attain the same number of electrons on either side. We multiply the reactions, yielding this. Okay. So you just don't forget to multiply that 5 times the 2. That's a place where people screw up. They, they get this one, 5 oxalates, but they forget to take that 5 over here, hit the 2, and come down to the 10. Okay. So 5 times 2 is 10 of those, 5 times 2 is 10 electrons, and then they multiply the next reaction by, by 2, so we end up with 2 times 5 is 10 electrons, don't forget 2 times 8, etc., all the way across. And now these numbers match. So you see the 10 electrons on reactants and products? That's a good handshake, right? One gives up 10, the other takes 10. And so now that gets us the correct stoichiometric ratios. Now we know these react in a two to five ratio. If you didn't know the number of electrons, you could not get the correct stoichiometric ratio in a balanced redox reaction. It wouldn't be balanced. It might look balanced with the elements, but the number of electrons are really governing how these react. And so how would you know that it's a five to two mole ratio? This is the only way is to get those electrons to balance. So, so that's, a, that's the trick, I guess. So when they, we add these together, things that are on both sides cancel, including those electrons. And so the electrons are gone. Since they're the same number on both sides, they cancel out. So we can draw a you know, big old line here and just add everything down. And the order doesn't matter. We can do the 16 protons permanganate, this oxalate comes down here, and then manganese, the water, and then the CO2. 
So we're just adding everything down just like it's a, a math equation. Here's a second chance to check your work. So if we've not screwed anything up, our charges will balance and our elements will balance. And so we have a 16 plus from the hydrogens, minus two for the two permanganates, minus 10, five times minus two here. So this is, you know, that guy right there, you know, two times the minus one is there, 16 times the plus is there. So you see how it works. And then that equals the two uh, times two here. Yeah, so it, it adds up. I mean, we've got 16 minus 12 is plus four. So, And then check your elements. We have 16 hydrogens on both sides. This one is the eight times two, okay? We have uh, 28 oxygens. So where, where did that come from? Where there's the eight here, and then the 10 times two there. So that gives us 28 oxygens and then 10 carbons, et cetera. So you can, over here, we've got a lot of oxygens. We've got five times four is 20, and two times four is eight, so 28. Uh, 16 hydrogens is easy, two manganese. And five times two t uh, is 10 carbons. So it's really nice. It's, I don't know. I hate Sudoku, but I love this. So uh, it's the same kind of thing. If you, if you try to treat it like a puzzle, I think it makes it much more enjoyable. And obviously I enjoy it. So. Let's practice on a couple more. Okay. Oh, no, just before we do that. This is this is the electrochemistry, right? And so this is um, what where our batteries come from. We couple these reactions and we can make those 10 electrons run through a circuit. I have a question. If yeah, we'll go back. back for a second. Yeah. So you said we could like make it as big as we wanted. So let's say this is all doubled, like 36 H exactly. or whatever, right? Are we supposed to re, uh, like reduce it, divide it? Is there a way to do yeah, that? Yeah, so then at the bottom, let's say you doubled everything, okay? okay? Unnecessarily. You get to the <laughs> bottom and you, you, you have, um, you could get to a smaller, uh, like if you divided everything by two, nothing would be a half, right? So let's say this was... If this was 32, 4, 10, 4, 16, and 20. And I'm looking at those and I'm thinking, I could divide all of those by 2 and not have a half, right? And, and so, but like these earlier ones, 16, 2, everything I could divide by 2 without having a half except this one. If I divided that 5 by 2, I would have 2 and a half. Okay, so I could simplify all of those coefficients if I had these bottom ones right here. Everything would balance out, but I would realize I must have doubled something I didn't need to double. And so I could divide all of them and still get whole numbers for all my coefficients. So that would be like simplifying a fraction or simplifying, you know, the coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very good. So if we have these these reactions, these have a certain potential. What do I mean by potential? It's um, the, the correct name, the physics name is electromotive force, EMF. It's pushing those electrons. It's pushing. And that, that, that push on the electron is what we call voltage. Okay, so every reaction, every electrochemical reaction has a different push on the electrons. Just like we have a different pH or pKa for the acid and how wants it how it wants to donate a proton we have the same kind of thing on the electrons but we call it voltage and so this top reaction has an electron has an oxidation voltage of 0.49 this next reaction has a reduction potential of 1.51 and so if we have these reactions added together we can add the push power of the different reactions too. And so this would produce a two volt battery. If we could figure out how to get these reactions to work together to push the electrons through the circuit, then it would push with a voltage of two volts, which is a pretty good voltage. Our one and a half, you know, double A's and so on, those are one and a half volts. So this would be even better, okay. Um, so this is the electrical potential of the system at one atmosphere, 25 degrees C, and one molar concentrations for all the aqueous species. And here's the thing. When we multiply by the five or the two, we do not 
do not multiply the potentials. We multiplied the delta H of reactions, we multiply the delta G's, the delta S's, but for voltage, we do not multiply those, those push powers. It's because it's, a, because it's a, a force, not a quantity. Think about the joules of heat that leave the system. If I have twice as many reactants, I have twice as much heat coming out. But this is push power, okay? Current is amount. This is voltage. So think of voltage like a waterfall, okay? So I've got a waterfall here, and the water's pouring over. Okay, so voltage is, is altitude. Okay? And current, this is current. Current is uh, sort of the width. So if we double the reactants, we might double the current, but we don't double the voltage. We don't make the waterfall higher. The voltage is how high the waterfall is. The current is how wide it is, okay? And so whenever we have oxidation reduction reactions and we multiply the top one by five and the bottom one by two, I guarantee, and I'm sad about it, some of y'all are gonna vote, multiply the voltage. <laughs> but I'm trying to emphasize as hard as I can, don't do that. Because this is, again, just how, how hard it pushes, not how much it pushes. If it's a quantity, like a number of joules that come out of the reaction, we're getting more quantity of heat. So we do multiply delta H of reaction, delta G of reaction, but we never multiply the voltage because it's a, it's a push power. It's a, it's a force, not a quantity. Hopefully that helps. Um, the tables contain all these reactions written as reduction potentials. So when we write the reaction as an oxidation, we flip the sign. And you can see that in these tables. So this table is in your homework from last week. Now you get to use it. So these are all of the, um, all of the push powers of all of these half reactions. Now we made a table and we haven't talked about the reference state. Well, the reference state is hydrogen uh, gas coming from acid uh, protons. So the hydrogen electrode is our zero voltage. It's not listed on this table, but, but that's, that would be right here. So this, um, the hydrogen reduction potential, um, so H plus uh, two of those plus two electrons gives H2 gas, would be zero volts by definition. So, and because we made that definition, just like we made the definitions for enthalpy and entropy and so on, now that we have a definition, we can rank every other half reaction relative to that hydrogen half reaction. We'll get into this more, but, but clockwise cycles in this table are spontaneous. So if I pair this chlorine gas with anything down here, um, let's pick something like... Um, Let's pick sodium ions, okay? So I've got, this is the forward reaction. This is the reverse reaction. Okay, that's gonna produce a positive potential. I have a plus 1.36, and I'm gonna subtract this one, which is a minus a negative number. And so I'm gonna make uh, sodium, oh, I did aluminum. So aluminum go to aluminum three plus, and chlorine, will go to chloride. And so these are the reactants here. If I put chlorine gas on aluminum metal, it will destroy it. Yeah, and it will make chloride and aluminum cations. So it'll steal those electrons from that aluminum, oxidize the aluminum, and the chlorine will make chloride. And if there's water involved, so it could be aqueous, it's gonna really go fast. In fact, it'll, it's a really violent reaction um, because it's, um, the redox, uh, the oxidation and reduction potentials all line up to where they're positive. And so positive reduction potentials are spontaneous and we'll get into that next time. All right, so enjoy.